Welcome to Block Stars, Ripple's podcast that features leaders in crypto and blockchain to discuss the basics of these technologies, the current landscape, and the real world problems being solved. I'm your host, Ripple CTO David Schwartz. In the past year, Mexico has seen a booming crypto market, and the country is embracing this technology at breakneck speed. Here to discuss the landscape and why this country is ripe for crypto adoption is Daniel Vogel, CEO and co founder of Mexico's leading crypto exchange, Bitso. It's great to have you on our episode, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me, David. Excited to be here. All right. In May of 2020, uh, Bitso announced a 342% trading volume growth over just eight months, less than a year, and more than a million users, the vast majority of which, over 90%, are Mexican. That's an incredible growth rate. What, what's going on? Why? Absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. So I would, I would divide it into two. The number one, when we think of customer adoption of crypto in Mexico, what we are seeing is a complex macroeconomic environment where the Mexican peso is being very volatile against the U.S. dollar. A lot of uncertainty, uh, you know, from an economic perspective. And what we're seeing are individuals that are having a hard time accessing currencies like the dollar being able to do so with crypto. And so a very large chunk of that increase in volume came from stable coin demand. Customers in Mexico who have a hard time having a, a bank account in US dollars that are fleeing to crypto exchanges to basically be able to protect their assets. And they see the dollar as a way to do that. And they see crypto exchanges that allow them to convert very easily to and from as a really good way for diversifying but being able to have that liquidity on demand whenever they want to. And so, so store of value is the key use case? Store of value being a huge use case today. And, and, and definitely in the, in the months between March 2020 and May 2020, as the world was trying to understand what coronavirus meant, what were going to be the macroeconomic impacts of it, um, a, a lot of people fleeing to, to stablecoins. We saw just a huge amount of stablecoin demand. The, the second reason why volumes increased significantly were actually because of the adoption of ODL or on-demand liquidity. On-demand liquidity, which is this product that Ripple has built and we are a partner of in Mexico, allows licensed money transmitters to move assets very quickly between U.S. dollars and Mexican pesos and utilizes exchanges like Bitso to get that liquidity. And so we saw a significant amount of volume on the exchange triggered by a significant amount of growth in ODL volume. So obviously remittances are a significant fraction of that volume. Correct. And one of the things that we have seen in the current, again, macroeconomic environment is that remittances are a huge livelihood for Mexicans, and they have only increased as a result of this pandemic. A lot of people in Mexico have lost their source of income, and they are being held by their counterparties in the United States. And so remittances have grown significantly, and we definitely saw a big uptick in that volume come through ODL between March and, and May of 2020. So along with the volatility of the peso, is a lack of access to conventional financial systems or financial products also a factor? So this is interesting specifically around the DeFi craze that we're seeing today. And our thesis is that absolutely, there's a huge lack of access to traditional sort of, well, not traditional, but just like regular financial infrastructure in, in, in places like Mexico. You know, you have a, a, a country of 125 million people where roughly about 25 to 30% of those are banked and a huge portion of those use their banks simply to receive payments and then withdraw it at ATMs. So there's like very little financial literacy in the country, very little access to financial products and services. And we definitely have seen people who are borrowing um, or, in, or, or, you know, using interest-bearing accounts paired with sort of like these, you know, fleeing to the dollar and then basically putting some of those stable coins into interest-bearing accounts. 
However, we're not really seeing the retail customers use DeFi products simply because of the cost today involved in using those DeFi products. Today, a transaction in Ethereum, you know, where September 2020 costs you in the order of $20 to make. And so that prices out a good portion of Mexican individuals who would like to put in maybe $100 into in, into one of these services, products and services. However, we believe that the trend is very clear. And as we solve those issues, uh, we're going to see a lot more demand for these types of products and services in places like Mexico and Argentina. And, and those are essentially substitutes for conventional financial products that just either aren't available or just don't provide the types of, the types of services that your customers need? Exactly. Or, or they are provided, but not to a lot of the customers that we have. So, you know, if you're an ultra high net worth individual in Mexico, you can get access to top notch financial services. But if you are someone that is earning, you know, $500 a month, you're not interesting to the financial institutions in Mexico. And one of the huge power, like a big power of crypto is the democratization of access. And, um, and, and so we're very bullish about that long-term trend. We believe that there's going to be something very interesting happening because even if you are you know, financially literate, if, if you don't earn over a certain amount of money, you're just not interesting to financial institutions. And so there's very little access and crypto solves that problem. I have to say it, you know, most of what I'm used to experiencing from people in crypto, people like in the United States, is essentially just substitutes for services that basically people are, that people already have that have like incremental benefits in terms of speed or cost or convenience. But here, the, these are core financial services that people just don't have access to. Yep. It sounds a little crazy, but it really is that. we When we started Bitso, actually, that was one of the key reasons why we wanted to base ourselves in Mexico. And when you look at crypto as an industry from a speculation perspective, Mexico wasn't the right bet because there's a lot less disposable income in a place like Mexico. No? And so for speculation, being based in, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, where there's a lot more disposable income was basically the right place to be. However, if our thesis is correct that the long-term importance of this technology is to democratize access then we believe that emerging markets will play a leading role in making the technology be actually relevant for humanity over the longer term. Do you think regulators understand the benefits that these technologies can bring to ordinary Mexicans? I believe so. It, it hasn't been easy. It's been a long journey for us uh, navigating the regulatory landscape in Mexico. We've played a strong hand in shaping it as well. And what I would say is like with any emerging technology, you have regulators who misunderstand the benefits or, or they misprice what the technology will be able to achieve in the long term. And so they take a very conservative approach in the, in the short term, which might end up hurting your, the long term prospects of the technology or the technology success. However, I would say that I'm very pleased that we've we've been able to secure meetings with folks at basically every relevant regulatory institution in Mexico or a regulatory agency in Mexico and we have always found individuals in in each of those institutions that's willing to listen and who is intrigued by the technology. And I think that in a place like Mexico, where you have such a financial inclusion and financial access problem, as a regulator, you kind of need to be very careful of not of making sure that you're not left behind, right? And there's so much literature out there and so many enthusiasts for this technology or, you know, so many enthusiasts that believe this technology are going to solve those pain points that it puts regulators um, in a position where if they flat out ban this or become very unfriendly to it, they might end up hurting the prospects of the folks that they ultimately serve. And so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting you know, place to be, I believe, as a regulator when it comes to this technology. So there's two sort of sides to regulation. One is when the regulators tell you that you can't do something or they don't license your business or they have onerous you know, reporting requirements. Or and the other side is when they tell you that what you're doing is fine, but then your banking partners say, oh, there's too much risk or you can't open accounts or maintain connections to the domestic financial system. Has that been an issue for you or for others in the region trying to use cryptocurrencies? A hundred percent. You know, when we started the business, 
you know, we were always very proactive with both our banking partners and regulators, but it was always a huge catch-22, right? The, you, were, you couldn't build out an interesting business where you could prove out the benefits of this technology because no one wanted to serve you. Um, but because nobody wanted to serve you, you could never prove out the long-term benefits of this technology. No? And so the approach that we took was trying to take the spirit of the law and adapt it. And so to that extent, we had you know KYC, AML procedures since the beginning. Our first hire was someone who had worked at a regulatory agency who had a background in, in, in this. And we were able to get the banks comfortable enough um, to bank us. And then, and then with that, we were able to slowly convince the regulators. And today, Mexico has a pretty, I would say, comprehensive set of regulations if you want to build a crypto business in country. That, that you can that anyone who wants can follow and it's not easy but it at least gives you clarity and certainty and that allows you to build partnerships so as someone who's worked developing these blockchain technologies um, we always sort of had this hope that that we would be able to improve people's lives that we would be able to particularly people who are underserved by the existing financial system or unbanked are you literally watching that happen are you watching the promise of blockchain deliver beyond you know we see we see people who got rich from mining, or we see people who bought Bitcoin at you know a hundred dollars and sold it at ten thousand. And sure, it's great that that's great. But but what we really want to do is make the world a better place. Are, are, are you are, are you getting to watch that happen like for real? So we're we're getting to watch it for real, but with a lot of missteps. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you a little story. In two thousand and sixteen, we the the biggest source of growth for Bitso were young adults who wanted to buy video games online. And we're paying with Bitcoin, and 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 Steam used to take Bitcoin payments back then, and it it was the traction was such that we had an advisor who told us, why don't you just pivot away from crypto and just make like turn yourself into a comp payment processing company for video gamers in Mexico who don't have credit cards, who didn't have access to banking, who you know just. People who were enthusiasts had money but didn't have access and couldn't engage in this digital economy. And ultimately, we decided against that. But what was very tragic was that in 2017, when block uh, space was very demanded in the Bitcoin blockchain, you basically got into a situation where everyone was priced out. And all of those individuals who were using Bitcoin back then got completely priced out. And so we went from growing 20 to 25% month over month on these transactions, it just go to zero, right? Like in, in a span of two months. And, um, and, and, and then you go into the speculation wave, right? And so the speculation wave is what you were referring. People were just getting rich. So no one, no one cared, right? Like anyone who had ever used crypto, even these young adults who were using it to pay video games are like, well, I'm now using it just to get rich. And then you get into a world of pain when the bubble burst, because a lot of these people lost a lot of money too. Then I think the thing that's been, you know, our, our, our mission as a company is to make crypto useful. And, and, and to that extent, we, we, we get up every morning because we want to we wanna make the world a better place. And, and products like ODL are exciting. Access to stable coins is super exciting. We, we just expanded into Argentina and Argentina is a very interesting country for a lot of other reasons. But, you know, I'm, I'm 35 years old. People my age have probably seen their savings go to zero three times in their lifetimes. And, and so the ability to access um, the store of value is, 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 is huge. And, um, and, and, and I think we have a really long way to go with, with crypto adoption and making crypto useful and relevant for, for everyday use. But we're definitely seeing all the signs of this happening. A lot slower than we first anticipated, but, but all the signs are there, all the metrics are there, the traction is there, and now we need to make sure that we go exponential on that. So uh, a lot of people in Mexico depend on remittances, something like thirty-six billion dollars a year. With the U.S. as one of the you know major countries on the other end of those remittance flows, do you, do you see customers who are sort of putting together their own remittance system, like getting people in the United States or in other countries to send them either stable coins or cryptocurrencies, and then using your exchange to convert that back into Mexican pesos? Yeah. So so out of those thirty-six billion that you quote, basically. 
all of it is from the United States. It's like 97% comes from the United States. And, um, and we definitely see people who are building, like people who have figured this out, either from ATMs that they access crypto to, or people who you know um, have figured out a way to get documentation in the United States enough that they can get an account on board at an exchange there. But I wouldn't say that it's the norm. I think we have a long ways to go to really help uh, the end customers there, right? Like uh, what, we're, what we're building with ODL is ultimately serving the license money transmitters. And again, when we're talking about ODL, what we mean is on-demand liquidity, which is a product that allows fiat currency conversion utilizing crypto technology. And so in, in our case, we're assisting in the conversion of U.S. dollars to Mexican pesos, where XRP is a bridge currency. And we, w the aim is to make sure that ODL provides with an experience that is, again, faster, cheaper, m more efficient than, than any traditional rail has ever built. And hopefully through savings there, we can pass on those savings to the end customer. But I think ultimately what the industry needs to really aim for is at disrupting all of that and making value transfer seamless for individuals. But, but, but the customer experience for a migrant who has fled Mexico because Mexico doesn't, didn't give him or her the opportunities um, to feed their families or whatever, and they, a lot of these folks go to the United States without speaking English, without having any documentation whatsoever, it's pretty complex. It's still pretty complex for them to, to access crypto and be able to send it back home. But I think there's a lot of really interesting initiatives that we're seeing, but none of them are really growing at, um, at, at a big scale. One of the ways that an, that an alternative can provide improvements to people is it pressures the incumbents to provide either better services or lower costs or, you know, to fend off the competition. Do you think traditional banks and remittance companies and other financial service companies are going to start seeing pressure from blockchain alternatives or are they already? I definitely think that that's, we're going to see a very interesting push in the next two years. And, and the reason why I say two years is twofold. Number one, because finally in Mexico, we have regulatory clarity. And so, and this is very new. The, basically the first FinTech license has just been granted and that'll allow people to start utilizing technologies like this to do uh, cross-border cross transmissions fully regulated, understanding the extent of the law and what they can do. And I think that's very important because this is a highly regulated business anywhere in the world, money transmission is. And so a lot of these blockchain first or crypto first money transmitters that were emerging in the United States always had issues, right? With when they were sort of like, well, show me the full flow. And it's like, well, and then we get to this crypto exchange in Mexico. And even though we try to do everything above board and, and, and be really good with regulators, there was always this, this, well, what licensing do they have? Well, nothing yet. No, well, that doesn't make, no. now we've basically figured out a way through licensing and partnerships that allows the entire stack to be regulated. And so that'll give a lot of certainty to regulators, both in Mexico and in the United States, that this is a, you know, a sound operation. And, and, and that's one reason. And the second reason why I believe that this is going to happen is because I think through COVID, we've learned that the world can become a lot more digital than we were used to. And, and this is expanding in a lot of spheres. And I would expect that it'll go, it's going to have a long-term impact on sort of like the digitalization of, consum of consumer financial services to the segment, to a segment that had been very forgotten about. I know a big problem in a lot of countries is sort of the last mile. Uh, get you know your customers. I assume need Mexican pesos to buy groceries or pay their phone bill or do whatever it is you know they're they're going to do. Um, is that a, is that an issue for you? Are there good ways for people to get Mexican pesos out? Yeah. So when I was saying that this the, the second bit that I was just referring to on my last answer, that's exactly what I mean. So for example, um, Mexico, uh, the, the the Mexican central bank has been pushing for a digital payment system in country, similar to what you see in China, where all the payments are QR codes. 
Um, Mexico's interbank payment system is one of the most advanced uh, advanced ones in the world. It's a real-time growth settlement system. It started for large value payments and then it started becoming used for low value payments. And now we're at the point where this system is going to be used for sort of like QR payments. And there's a big regulatory push to basically get um, uh, stores and basically anyone who accepts credit cards to accept these QR payments. And, and that for us is going to be a very interesting inflection point because it'll allow us to create products where people receive pesos digitally, but can actually use them very easily and very cheaply. So when I was when I said, you know, with COVID, you're getting to this point of like digitalization, it's becoming very obvious now around the world that cash is super expensive and transacting in cash is very expensive and securing it and transporting it and accounting for it, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas digital cash is very, very cheap. And so our hope is that we're going to be able to very soon provide alternatives where individuals can not only receive digital cash, but solve the last mile issues through these uh, pretty comprehensive programs that um, that are being worked on at various different levels in, in Mexico. Bitso launched back in 2014. That was before stable coins were really on the scene in a way that people really knew about them. That was before people would have thought that a crypto exchange was a license to print money. That was before you know companies like Coinbase reported outrageous amounts of money made. And that was really before any of the things that you mentioned were possible to do in the space. So, so what did you see that made you think that a cryptocurrency exchange in Mexico was the thing to do? It's a great question. I think the the ultimately going back to sort of like my notes on 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 why do this. I think I was very I was very excited about this possibility of rewriting the financial system, and I've always liked you know, the concept of open source software. I've always liked the, the idea of getting people around the world to contribute and and, and build magnificent stuff. You know, I, I saw the transition in my household of a household without internet to a household with internet. And with that transition, I also got to see the transition of having encyclopedia in my house that you would like take out and read stuff and then accessing stuff on Wikipedia. And... And I loved I mean, my favorite band growing up and still today is Radiohead. And there were no Radiohead entries on the encyclopedia that my parents had in, at, at our house. But I could read a ton about Radiohead on the internet, written by strangers all over the world. And I just loved that. It was just like, it just, it was just different. And, and that excitement of being able to access and connect with individuals all over the world and contribute and learn from them, et cetera, et cetera, was something that changed me very significantly and probably the reason why I wanted to study technology, et cetera, et cetera. And when I saw crypto, I just saw the same opportunity, but for finance. And I didn't know how, but if, but, but if you, you know, there's a, there's a great interview um, with the, the, the other two founders of Bitso where they talk in 2014 about remittances as a, as a potential use for crypto, right? And um and I would say that we were just very excited about the technology, seeing a lot of trends that we had witnessed early on in our lives that we thought were going to be very relevant. But we we acknowledged that it was going to take time and we and we acknowledged that we didn't have all the answers, but that it was the right thing to jump into. And um, interestingly, we always think that, you know, there's all this craze on stable coins today, but we used to have stable coins Back in the day with the Ripple gateways, we used to issue uh, Bitso MXN and, and, and whatnot on the Ripple ledger. And, um, and, and it's just crazy how that was so early on, but, it's, but, but, but today would be or it is so relevant, that, that, that piece of technology. And, um, and, and we tried that, right? Like we tried that back then and, and we're trying it again uh, now. And, and I think the industry is moving in a really interesting space. Uh, you know, there's a lot more. I think in 2014, one of the big pieces that was missing was just infrastructure all over the place. And I think we're slowly fixing the infrastructure piece. I think there's a big opportunity still in LATAM, but in a lot of other places in the world, that's very, very, very well taken care of. And that just provides a ton of opportunity for building use cases. And that's exciting for us. 
So I'll ask you the question that I always find impossible to answer. So you've been in this business for six years, from 2014 to 2020. You've watched the industry evolve. You've watched your business evolve. You had these early ideas of what you thought you could do, and you know where you are now. Would you say that the industry has been moving faster or slower than you expected or about what you expected? Yeah, this is a, this is a great <laughs> question. It's so difficult. I would say... I know. Sometimes look, I feel like we're moving at the speed of light, and other times I feel like it takes forever to get anything done. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, to, to, I, have, I, I have an impossible time catching up with everything that's happening on DeFi today. Right? It just seems like there's like this Cambrian explosion of stuff. And I felt the same thing in 2017 when all these ICOs were happening. And I was like, what are all these projects? What, what's all this stuff that's happening? You know? And how do, how do I catch, like, what's the latest three-letter symbol that I'm supposed to know because everyone's talking about? Um, but you go through these, through these ebbs and flows and, and, and these waves and, and you ride them and you fight them and you survive them and you come out hopefully stronger, uh, after them. And I would say that, I would say that I, I, I overestimated, like, for example, when we thought about remittances in 2014, I would have thought that we would have been able to get to 1% of the remittance flow between the U.S. and Mexico a lot quicker. I always thought by 2017, we will have at least 1% of that flow. And we had basically zero in 2017. And then suddenly it's May 2020, and we're processing close to 10% of the remittances from the U.S. to Mexico through, through ODL. No? And, um, and so you go through these sort of like periods where you overestimate what you can do. I think there's a famous quote somewhere like people tend to overestimate what we're going to achieve in the next year, but underestimate what we'll achieve in 10 years. And I definitely feel that's the case with, uh, with crypto. And so I would say that there's places where we still, like we still, you know, I, I talked to my mother-in-law who is a 50-year-old woman in Germany and I talked to her about crypto and it's still, for her, I'm still talking to her in like some crazy magic internet money and like thank you I go to bed and have sweet dreams kind of conversation so so we haven't really reached those folks but i think like if you look at other numbers it's very clear right like the, the amount of transactions that are happening the amount of exchanges that are the, the infrastructure that's getting built out in the world the uh, you know the the, the 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 remittance flow between the us and mexico that's going through crypto the, the the investment amount there's all these other very clear indicators that the industry is actually growing very very strongly and i think that's very exciting so is the MoneyGram partnership and on-demand liquidity impacting the recipients yet? Uh, from a money-saving perspective? Well, that's certainly, that's certainly important. I know that the cost of remittances is borne by some of the people you know, who are worst able to bear those kinds of costs. And that like, relative to the size of the payment, the costs are just you know, extremely high. Yeah, I would say that we still need to work in making ODL be really the life changing product for MoneyGram and, and other partners. And I think we're doing great strides at making sure that we're advancing with a very clear plan to get there. And I think there's clear goalposts that you know we have as a company and Ripple has as a company that we're advancing together to hit. And we've always thought that this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. But I think, you know, if, if this is a marathon, I think we're still on, you know, mile four. It, there's still a long ways to go. But it's what you're starting to feel it. You know, this is this is the moment where you decide whether you you're gonna go through it and finish this whole thing or you're gonna give up and uh we're definitely continuing to run. Yeah, I do have to say one thing that surprised me is how difficult it is, even if you build a better system and even if you can convince the major players to use it, it is quite difficult to get the benefits pushed down to the end user. It's just really difficult to, to, to it's like that, that, that last little bit of getting the benefits to the people who need it the most. It's just, it's an independent challenge. Yeah, and, and, war, and one that is very difficult for us to influence. Yeah. Well, and one problem is that if they're not convinced of your complete and total reliability, which can only happen over time, and they push the benefits to the customer, they're always worried that you can't you can't take something back from a customer. You can't make your product worse, and so they they need to they need to jump in, you know, with both feet. And it's just very difficult to get a big company to do that. Yeah. So tell us about Argentina. 
What do you got going on there? Yeah, so Argentina has been a fascinating journey. We launched there in February. A month later, we were all in lockdown. Argentina has been completely in lockdown. The, the skies are shut down. Borders are shut down a, a lot more aggressively than Mexico and, and, and the United States. We have onboarded over 100,000 users in Argentina in the last few months. And the demand for crypto, we believe, is just beginning. Basically, every month we're growing by 40 to 50 percent in volume, in users. And we believe that there's something very special happening there. Argentina has established capital controls. They're renegotiating their, their debt. You know, they've, they've defaulted and, and they're renegotiating, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these very crazy things that are very difficult for, for, for people that are not close to Argentina to understand. But there's like multiple exchange rates in the country. So if you want to get dollars with your Argentinian pesos, you get the official rate that the government gives you that you basically can't get, but it exists, right? And so that's a very cheap exchange rate. Um, then, and then there's all these other methodologies that you can use to get U.S. dollars. And so some of them is like you buy bonds, government bonds in Argentina that you then sell on the stock exchange in the U.S., like in the New York Stock Exchange, and then you get dollars out of that. And so you're like triangulating bonds, but you're able to get dollars. And that's roughly about 60% higher than the official rate. Then there's like, you know, all these other methodologies, like with soy, there's like the soy dollar, there's like the, you know, now there's a crypto dollar, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting is that like the Argentina, you know, it, it, the value of the Argentinian peso is depreciating very rapidly. And so people, whenever they get paid, they basically pay all of their bills immediately because their money is worth less tomorrow than it is today. And so then there's this like huge demand for any sort of instrument that allows me to sort of retain my value, whether that's, you know, interest bearing accounts in country, whether that's investing in buying dollars on the streets, whether that's buying crypto, et cetera, et cetera. But crypto is presenting a very interesting opportunity for the government because it's an ability to relieve pressure from the demand of the U.S. dollar in a way that doesn't deplete the national sort of like treasuries of U.S. dollar that the central bank has. So it's like a very interesting sort of like, um, you know, almost like if you have a pressure cooker and you have this sort of like steam release valves, um, it, it's sort of like functioning like that. I, demand for stablecoin is incredible in, in Argentina. We One of the stablecoins that we offer in the platform is DAI, and we definitely see an outsized demand for DAI in Argentina. Argentina has a very active blockchain development community. And so we're seeing a lot of people who work in Argentina and get paid in stable coins and then they keep them at the platform. And the, what we allow them to do is, you know, very quickly get liquidity in Argentinian pesos and then uh, give them the ability to spend those Argentinian pesos uh, practically on real time. So we do real time a gross settlement in Argentina as well, both for incoming transactions and outgoing transactions. And so that's enabling a bunch of use cases, very interesting use cases. People who are, you know, giving cooking classes to international audiences and getting paid in, in crypto, people who are just saving in crypto. And so, you know, Argentina is a country of 44 million people and, and, and we have just 100,000 clients. So we think there's a really long ways to go. But we're going to be launching very interesting experiments specifically around this issue that we were talking about before on, you know, building really financial services built on top of crypto that enable use cases for a customer set that, you know, you don't necessarily want them to understand all the complexities of crypto. And so hopefully, um, you know, if, if we get to talk again in, in, in six months or so, I'll be able to, to answer that question that you asked before a lot more definitively. Are we seeing crypto being used to change the everyday life of people? Uh, I think in six months I'll be able to say uh, either, you know, we tried and we failed or absolutely this technology is being life changing in a place like, like Argentina. So what are the obstacles? What are the, what are the headwinds that you're pushing against? 
So, so I think one of, one of the big issues that we're going to find in Argentina is regulation. You know, just the fact that we that the country has capital controls puts into question the entire effort of uh, uh, allowing crypto in in country. We're working with the regulatory authorities to make sure that we're working with them as opposed to in any way against them and whatnot. And that's always been very core of what we do as a company is to make sure that we're very close to regulators. But things change very quickly in Latin, in places like Latin America. People can make very quickly the decision to basically change their minds on how something was going to work. I mean, the the, the, the mere fact that Argentina had a, a free floating exchange rate a year ago and then they don't they don't anymore gives you an idea of sort of like how radical policy changes can be in this side of the world. However, assuming that that doesn't happen or that we're able to navigate that. I think ultimately what we really need to do is we need to build experiences that individuals can very easily understand and benefit from the technology, but not necessarily, you know, I'm speaking to you and I'm looking at you right now and uh, I don't have a full understanding of really what the te- how the technology works that is allowing me to watch you right now and, and and for the recordings to take place. I have some level of understanding, but I don't understand every single piece. It's the same thing when I call someone. I have some level of understanding of what happens, but the majority of the people don't and they don't need to. What they care about are the experiences. And I think there needs to be a very strong focus on that. I need to make sure that as we build products, you know, someone like my mother-in-law can basically just understand how this is relevant to her and why she should be using it and not necessarily be worried about, you know, this is some bizarre thing that someone invented that I don't know who that is and uh, and governments say that this is used for money laundering and blah, 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 blah. They need to be able to say like, oh, here, I put in some money. I, I, I have a, a safe store of value. I trust the way that this is working. I'm earning interest perhaps on this, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm used to this experience and I like it. And it's superior than my bank. It's superior than any other financial services I've, I've had access to. And maybe on, on the back end, it's all powered by crypto. But I think mass adoption, we cannot expect people to become engineers and become technical enough to understand how the technology really works. They just need to benefit from the qualities of the technology. Yeah, that's definitely a pattern with every technology. If you had to be your own mechanic to, you know, own and drive a car, much you know, fewer people would have cars. You know, absolutely, definitely. So, what about uh, services other than buying and selling tokens, other than a crypto exchange? Is Bitso looking into providing other services? Yeah, absolutely. So we already have some. Um, so some of the services that we already offer in, 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 for example, in Mexico and Argentina is we have a peer-to-peer payment system. So you're able to send uh, money to, to friends, family, whatsoever. And, and it actually is quite used. And so specifically around folks that are like, you know, I'm going to save in dollars uh, and then I want to settle a payment with my landlord, with a friend, whatnot. They're able to like draw from that store of value and then make a payment very, very quickly. One of the things that's very different to Bitso than most other crypto exchanges is that we've put a big effort on making sure that uh, once you have crypto or money in the platform, you're able to easily spend that. And so in Mexico, we allow, for example, we've built technology and AML and KYC processes and procedures that allow a customer that has a balance to be able to send that through the interbank payment system to anyone. So if you have like Bitcoin and then you turn it into or XRP and you turn it into pesos, you can then pay your landlord through there or you can pay, you know, the gas utilities company or, or whatever. And so we're seeing a lot of people use that. We've been running tests on uh, on bill payments, and so we're gonna resume that uh, and, and hopefully do a much larger test in, in in upcoming months. But again, the ability of just making this a lot more useful. You were talking before about the last mile, and so we wanna we wanna start playing a lot more with that concept of the last mile. How do we make it a lot more relevant for folks? And um, and then one of the things that we're very excited about is uh, interest-bearing accounts. You know, if, if you're in Argentina and, and you can not only escape the depreciation of, of the Argentinian peso you know, by, by having dollars, but then you can, you know, put those into, into some sort of instrument that is bearing interest, 
Um, that's going to be something that's going to really resonate in country. And so we're excited about providing that level of, of you know, those sort of services to our customers. So when your customers are unbanked or underbanked, this is sort of a natural tendency to become a bank because they don't have access to any of those services and they want them. Correct. But, but what's interesting here is we're trying to figure out how to build all of these things in a way that like, um, you know, for example, when, when, when you think of interest bearing accounts, like, you know, well, we could build our own, right? Like we could, we could take their money and then we could lend it out and then you know, give them some sort of an interest. What we're trying to figure out is whether, you know, the path forward should really be integrating with all of these, uh, you know, DeFi protocols that allow you, or, or would allow our customers to basically get interest from there. And so you continue with this sort of trend of decentralizing or this trend of breaking down the parts. Um, and that's that's a really interesting question for us and, 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 and definitely one that we continue to explore. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, it's, it's interesting to study, like if you're trying to build DeFi products that meet real needs, here you have a group of customers who have act, who have the ability to get money in and out because they're your customers and you just need to provide the financial services that meet their needs. I, I guess fees is, is still a big obstacle. Yep. Yeah, fees is a big obstacle. We hope that that gets solved, but I think it's going to take a long time. Um, but uh, But at the same time, you know, the, the other trend that we're seeing is like, you know, perhaps you can build this in-house with a vision that as you start solving the fees question, you can start migrating those functions in-house to, to these sort of decentralized protocols. And I think a lot of things are going to happen uh, over the next few months that are going to give us a lot of visibility into the sustainability of everything that's happening on the, on the DeFi world, which is coming into question by a lot of groups. Yeah, there might be some way that like a, a company like Bitso could aggregate transactions and sort of bundle them to you know reduce the fees or something clever like that. I don't know. Yep. So we're just about out of time. I, I always like to ask a, a sort of broad closing question. So where do you see the industry headed? Where's Bitso going to be five years from now? Yeah, the bet that we are making as a company. So when when we sort of think of what are we building towards, I would say that there's there's a few theses that we have that we're trying to see how they play out. N number one, we really believe that a radically improved financial system is being created on top of this technology. And, and yes, it's only emerging and it's slowing and whatnot, but we believe that there's a very clear trend there that is just going to, to continue. And, and, and there's pieces all over the place, right? Like there's pieces on payments, there's pieces on savings, there's pieces on name it, investing, et cetera, et cetera. We believe that in Latin America, you have an immediate area of opportunity for building real use cases on top of this technology. And why LATAM? Because trust in financial institutions is eroded, access is very limited, and 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 there's there's just a very big need for for these sort of financial services and products. And 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 number three, we believe that the intersection between the traditional world of fiat, where you have the legacy payment systems, regulation, compliance, etc., and and this new crypto realm is something that's going to have to coexist for quite some time, and that. You know, we want to make sure that we are delivering value to, to, to humanity by making sure that that intersection is as flawless and as easy as possible for customers in, in the region. So we want to make sure that people can go in and out of crypto very, very seamless using our rails because we believe that the fiat world in five years is still going to be there and that, um, and, and, and that we can add a lot of value by making sure that the transition between crypto and fiat is super seamless. Thank you for joining me, Daniel. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. It was a pleasure hosting you on Ripple's podcast, Blockstars. And listeners, thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions about this episode or feedback for new episodes, please reach out to me on Twitter at Joel Katz, J-O-E-L-K-A-T-Z, or to the Ripple team on Twitter at Ripple. See you around the blockchain. <laughs>